All right, um, I guess I'll start. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about um, uh, part of my PhD thesis um, and it's the development of this electromagnetic RF edge interactions mini app called STIX, which uses MFEM as this underlying finite element library. So, ooh. okay, there we go. Uh, just as a quick background, um, I'm gonna be talking about tokamaks, uh, specifically ion cyclotron radio frequency heating. Uh, because it's important in fusion devices, we know that tokamaks need uh, external heating mechanisms to reach those very hot temperatures to reach fusion. A uh, common method uh, to use is RF waves, and a very common frequency range is the ICRF regime, because it's efficient, cost-effective, and the technology is there. Um, so uh, that's great. Uh, so there's a lot of current devices that use it, like JET. Um, and then there's a lot of um, upcoming devices like Spark and Arc that are gonna plan on using a lot of ICRF. So it's definitely gonna be relevant in the future as it is right now. So ICRF is great. Um, there is a negative side effect to them, um, which is the production of these large rectified potentials on plasma facing components, um, which can be on the order of hundreds of volts. And this is problematic because you can have hot spots and impurity generation um, on your materials, which is a bad thing for a tokamak reactor. Uh, so what is uh, RF sheath rectification? Because uh, that's uh, the main topic uh, of this talk. So just kind of as a quick diagram, if you use an I, uh, sorry, a current voltage uh, diagram, you can see, and you uh, apply an RF wave um, at the wall, you see at the positive swing of your RF wave, you get an excess electron current into the wall. And then on the negative swing of your RF wave, you get an ion current. But when you time average those, they don't cancel out, which is a problem because uh, plasmas don't like charge depletion. So what the plasma does is actually rectifies that area. As you can see by adding this, can you see my cursor? I think so. Um, you can see uh, by applying this DC uh, voltage offset. And you can see now when you plot the RF wave with the DC offset, and time average the currents, there's no charge depletion. But this VREC again is on the order of hundreds of volts um, a lot of times. So it's definitely very problematic. Um, so for the path to get fusion energy onto the uh, electrical grid, we're gonna have devices that are gonna use long pulses, probably the model we're gonna go down. Um, and if they're gonna use ICRF, this is gonna be an important effect model. And uh, doing it numerically. Uh, the questions we want to know are where do these uh, form, what factors influence the largest rectification, and the ways to mitigate um, the sputtering and hot spots that we get with ICRF. So um, that brings me to the motivation of the mini app called STIX. Uh, so we need an RF uh, simulation uh, model that encapsulates all the microscale physics of these very thin regions called sheaths. Um, in a global RF code. Um, and actually, because they're so thin uh, compared to the wavelength of the wave, we can actually approximate the sheath as a boundary condition. Uh, commonly used right now is Jim Myra's boundary condition from his 2015 paper. Basically, it uh, sets E tangential to the tangential gradient of the oscillating um, RF potential, which is dependent on the electric field displacement normal to the wall and a complex sheath impedance. So um, one of the main motivations behind the STIX mo uh, mini app was to incorporate this boundary condition in the RF code. And on top of that, um, have kind of the end goal will be to have an integrated model uh, that will encapsulate other physics besides just RF sheaths, uh, such as impurity generation. And then there's talks about coupling it to a transport code uh, called MAPS. So the result was the creation of this mini app called STIX. So uh, before I go into actually what STIX is, I want to briefly mention this boundary condition because that was a huge development for our mini app. Um, the basic problem was that it's nonlinear. So uh, as you can see, because it's dependent on the electric field and setting it on electric field tangentially. Uh, so, um, and then the other thing was that also the Z sheath here is uh, put into a parameterization code that again, Jim Meyer created in 2017 um, that actually helps get out the sheath potential so you can reuse it in your next loop um, for iterating. So 
what is the Styx Mini app? Uh, actually, originally it uh, was built off of the EM uh, way RF solver. I forget what it was called. I think maybe Hertz. Um, but basically we ended up, me and Mark Soul, um, ended up adapting it to a plasma situation. So uh, originally it actually solved the plasma wave equation in the electric field. Uh, I think someone else showed uh, that equation. Uh, now we're actually solving it with the magnetic field H for reasons I'll talk about later, um, but it's a frequency domain code using H curl basis functions. Um, and then yeah, computes H and then the corresponding fields as well with that. So uh, all the plasma physics is encoded in the uh, complex dielectric tensor. Uh, we're using cold plasma here, so there's no temperature effects, which is makes it a lot easier <laughs> to model. Um, uh, so that's all encapsulated into this epsilon tensor. Um, we do add some temp quote unquote temperature uh, only as a means to dissipate the wave when we need some damping. And you can add that in through a, um, uh, what is it, imaginary term in your dielectric. So that's there. Um, it's built off of MFEM, so it's a 3D code, but we use it really in pseudo 2D and pseudo 1D, mostly pseudo 2D. Um, and then we extrude the mesh in whatever directions we need it to and then add periodicity in the directions that we're not looking into. Um, lastly, oh, I think there's another point. Um, additionally, uh, the nonlinear sheet boundary condition was implemented. Right now it's using a fixed point iteration. We have really good success with stability that way. I did also dabble with doing minimal polynomial extrapolation. Um, and it converges a lot faster, but um, I haven't really looked into it past that. And then also it uses direct solvers, super LU and mumps, which is what I'm currently using. So the boundary condition was, um, again, like I said, the main development of the sticks. Uh, and I'll, originally we had it where we were solving for the E field, and then we get the electric displacement, calculate the potential, and then kind of doing this two-step process, but we never got stability that way. Um, it just never converged. We we're getting some weird behavior. So what we ended up doing was going to an H field solve because you can actually write the potential in terms of the uh, magnetic field H, as you can see on the second equation here. And then you have your wave equation, which is in your H field as well. Um, and then you can actually solve it through a block matrix um, solve. And then that way it actually cut the, the stack, uh, the, the two-step method into solving it at once. And then it iterates um, using GM res and and then for the actual boundary condition component, it iterates on the potential until it eventually stops at whatever converges criterion you set. Um, and then you get your rectified potentials out. So um, for this talk, I thought I would bridge it um, from the development of sticks um, to an actual experiment that was done um, actually at, at MIT on Alcator CMOD, uh, basically this power phasing study. And I think it's really cool to see kind of the code and the experiment actually um, kind of start comparing them to each other. So I'll introduce the experiment first. Uh, so you can see here on the right-hand side is a CAD drawing of the four strap antenna, ICRF antenna on CMOD. And this experiment done, basically what it did was it varied the power of the two central straps right here, this one and this one to the total uh, straps from roughly zero to one. So zero being all the power was on the outside of the straps, and then one was all the power was on the inside of the straps. Um, and then what they did was they measured the impurities and the plasma potential on and close by to the antenna, and actually saw some very interesting results. So that was kind of the motivation behind using sticks for this, because again, we want to go towards an integrated model approach. So we have the potentials through sticks, and then we can couple to a impurity flux code like Rust BCA to get some impurity fluxes out. So. The experiments, so this is all the experimental results. Um, uh, on the left-hand side is the ERL. It's basically a proxy for the plasma potential. And then on the right-hand side is the antenna impurities. And I just want to point out here, they're the trend really is what you should um, look at. On the left-hand side, the potentials were minimized between the power fractions of 0.8 and 0.9, which is a pretty strong fraction, uh, favoring most of the power being on the inside of the straps. And in the, uh, sorry, the impurity case, uh, all of it, sorry, all the minimization was a lot broader and happened between 0.5 and 0.9. This is all for one megawatt as well, um, constant power. 
Um, and they think the reason for this minimization has to do with image current cancelization on the antenna box, uh, which I'll go into also later in the talk. So uh, this is the experimental results and I wanted to simulate it with sticks. Uh, so the left-hand side again is that 3D domain, what it actually looks like re in real life. Again, I'm, I'm using a 2D code. So if you slice along the magnetic field, because this is a field aligned antenna, meaning that it's kind of in the same viewpoint of the magnetic field, and you look at it top down on top of the donut, um, you'll see this is what the mesh looks like um, for sticks. Also, um, this is just for visualization. My mesh is not the scores. Um, so this is just what it looks like before I do any AMR or serial refinement. So for the simulation setup, um, the density profile in this case is very important. Um, in this region for Tokamax, the gradient of the electric um, density is very, very strong, which gives me a lot of resolution issues, as you can kind of see on the right-hand side. Still working through a lot of that, but um, basically it's having to do AMR on, um, actually it was mentioned this lower hybrid resonance. Uh, I actually have that as well in my simulation. So it's a resonance, so it's going to infinity, and I ended up adding some clitinality to it to kind of dampen it out and then do AMR on that. And it works fairly successfully, but still, still a little noisy. But um, for the actual simulation of sticks, I end up using the equilibrium magnetic fields uh, calculated for this experiment. So it's using the actual magnetic fields. Um, it's a zero pi, zero pi phasing, which has to do with, um, it's just, it, that's what it was. Um, and then the um, sheet boundary condition, which is what uh, this whole case has kind of um, been brought about is located on the top and bottom here structures, which is called the RF limiters. So that's where um, the impurities and the sheath potentials were measured. So that's where I applied it. And then on top of that, I also added a artificial collisional profile uh, just so that the waves damp out before they hit the other side here on the left. And then again, the density profile is trying to mimic an experimental one, but it's a little idealistic. Um, but one of the other main points I want to bring it, uh, is that because of the density profile I use, actually launching a parasitic slow wave because the density is below the lower hybrid resonance in front of the straps. So that's something to note as well. So I ended up uh, putting those boundary conditions on. You can see kind of here on the left-hand side, uh, uh, the RF limiter block here, um, and then did the power scan and saw that um, most of the rectification happens on this inner corner on the left-hand, oh, sorry, on the right-hand side, as you can see. Um, this plus just to show like positionally how it varies and it's really this peak is kind of corresponding to this peak on the right. Um, and it also corresponds to the slow wave directly hitting the wall and rectifying. So that's nothing crazy. That's what we expect. So yeah, so the, so the density um, prescribes that this wave is going to hit the wall and rectify. So that's the kind of the area I was looking at when I was doing the scan. And then when I actually did the scan, you can see on the right, um, so I did it for two powers, um, one megawatt, one and a half megawatt, and you can actually, it's a little hard to see, but there's there's um, a minimization, I'd say between 0.8 and 0.95 for the one megawatt case. This is a qualitative, um, I'd say, comparison to experiment, because again, there's some guesswork with the densities um, used, because we don't have experimental measurements of that, because that's, you can't measure right in front of the antenna there. Um, but the trend exists and it also exists for higher power, although it's less broad, which I thought was pretty interesting. And the other fact I also noticed that that was interesting as a physics result, um, they saw an experiment that during the minimum of the potential for the scan, it actually ended up uh, being the same value as if there was no RF called the bone sheath. You can actually see this is the dotted line of the bone sheath. So it actually kind of reaches um, the bone sheath at the minimum as well. Also, everything's kept constant for these scans besides obviously the power fractions and the four straps. Um, so everything should be roughly the same for comparison purposes. Um, and then experimentally, they postulated that this had to do, at least the minimization had to do with image currents because uh, you have four straps, then you get can get, can get image currents on your antenna box um, and it kind of happens at least in that area. So um, what I did was I ended up doing a vacuum scan as well, just to see 
what the image currents looked like on this inner part where all the rectification happened. And for me, I saw that it pretty much, I don't even know if you could say it minimizes, but it hits 0.99 and then it goes up a little bit. This proxy for the image current, just H tangential, the magnitude of it. Um, so for me, it reaches 0.99 as a minimum. Um, so at least for my simulation, it shows that the slow wave is pushing the uh, minimum way further into the, the fraction of, again, 0 0.8 to 0 0.95, um, which I thought was an interesting result. So um, just as a summary, uh, so we have this mini app now called Styx. Again, it, it uh, couples RF wave propagation in cold plasma, so mostly at the edge, um, to an RF sheath boundary condition. So now we can get rectified potential values on whatever service you're looking at. And we thought we'd uh, apply it to a real experiment done on CMOD and saw um, that they had this minimum trend. Um, so we did it in 2D and saw that we also get that trend, which is great. Um, and then in vacuum that this minimum happens a lot at a lot higher refraction. So there is some influence of the slow wave on that minimum. And for future work, um, again, kind of doing an integrated model approach with uh, coupling it to the impurity flux code like Rust BCA and um, also doing this in 3D. So this is a, a really interesting 3D problem because there's an antenna box, the straps aren't infinite. Um, and there's been some studies done in vacuum with COMSOL that shows the strongest image current cancellations actually happen at the top and bottom corners of the RF antenna box. Um, and then also in 3D, Sinesh actually did some cool results with the West antenna um, that showed that there was also a lot more behavior on the top and bottom corners of the, the box. So um, I think I'm looking at an area where there's not as much uh, behavior going on uh, because again, it's right sliced right along the middle of the antenna strap. So, so yeah, that's uh, the results of sticks at the moment. Thank you. I, I just want to acknowledge, you know, you know, I'm the principal investigator for the project that that Christina worked with uh, the MFEM group on. And I just want to acknowledge the enormous amount of work and development, actually, that was needed from the MFEM group to do this problem. Uh, oh, yeah. Mark Stoll and and it really taught me a lesson in how how. You know how much work it can be to to, you know, do these kinds of things. It just isn't like taking an off-the-shelf item and using it. It was an enormous amount of development that we were very happy to be able to engage uh, Mark Stoll and others at, at MFEM. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, it took us three years to develop kind of what Sticks is now. So Nicola, can you want to mute yourself as well? Yeah. 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 Uh, wait. So, what do you use to? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, this is Trinity. Uh, Christina, good, good talk. Uh, I have one question actually. So, going back to the your formulation, uh, mm -hmm. I think you assume that the uh, sheath boundary you are putting is uh, on the exterior boundary. Have you ever thought about how the uh, equation should be formulated if it is interior boundary? For example, if you have a, a, you know vacuum and then you have a uh, sorry, if you have a plasma and then you have a ceramic facing to the plasma, and then she is developed, she is formed in on the top of the ceramic, then you want to simulate the entire domain, including the plasma region, the back, uh, ceramic region in, uh, in, in, in using finite element. Then that sheath has to be on, treated in, inside the computational memory, internal boundary. And in such situation, how would you do? That's a great question. Um, it's something I actually thought about because um, there were some interesting experiments done on the LAPD with Macor and I think a copper antenna. And yeah, so they wanted to do some RF sheath simulations with that. Um, so that was 
something I have to think about further. Uh, I'm not sure how that would be done, but I think it could be. Um, yeah, that's a great question, though. I, it needs to be looked at. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question to think about. I think it's worth thinking about. Thank you.